Welcome to Trina Talk. This is the podcast where guests share their stories of pursuing their passions, living a fulfilled life, and empowering others. Each week, I talk with inspiring leaders, business owners, and people with amazing stories from around the world in unscripted conversations as they share their successes and failures. This podcast is all about empowering you to keep striving in your personal and professional life. I am your host, Trina L. Martin. Hey, welcome to another episode. If you're listening, go ahead and go out and subscribe so that you won't miss any future episodes. Also, if you like the show, give us a five-star review. That way we can move up in the rankings and other people can find the show and be impacted and inspired just like you. My guest this week is Keith Renison. Keith is a Vietnam veteran and his experience there taught him to never waste time. It's too precious. To that end, he has lived an interesting life racing cars and bicycles, foreign travel, and climbing many of Colorado's famous 14ers. His award-winning book, Tenacity. You don't have to get lost in Nepal to find yourself, but it helps is based on his second trip to Nepal, where he traveled alone and got lost for a few days in the Himalayas. Hi, Keith. Welcome to Trina Talk. I am so happy to be here. I've been looking forward to this for so long. (laughs) Well, you know what? I am happy to have you here talking with me. Um, We were talking pre-show, but you have an interesting um, life and things that you're doing now. But how I always start the show, I always ask my guests to tell the listeners who you are and how you became the Keith that you are today. I guess I would have to say that it came from growing up in a company town where where they manufactured dynamite. I tell everybody I had an explosive childhood. I I know that's a really bad joke, but (laughs) it's true. I grew up in the 50s in a small town south of Littleton, Colorado called Levere's, and it was a DuPont dynamite factory, and there was only 300 residents, and it was stuck way outside Littleton on the prairie, and it was such an idyllic childhood because it was in the country, and I had farms and ranches around me, and that's who I went to school with, and I think that growing up in that environment made me really learn how to use my imagination as a little boy and learning how to play by myself and do the things I did. And I hunted and I fished. My dad was a great source for me for entertainment. And I, I had a lot of dad and mom time, which was wonderful. And I think that's what really helped me grow up to be the person I am today. Wow. That's very, very interesting. Your dynamite you know, <laughs> you're kind of my, you know, growing up your, your uh, upbringing. But right now you're, um, you're an author. You have several books and you are a speaker. You have actually, uh, we were talking uh, an assessment. So tell the listeners all about, you know, what you got going on with those books and your speaking and everything. I was a certified financial planner until about 10 years ago, Mm -hmm. and I retired from that, and I sat and played solitaire (laughs) because I didn't know what to do with myself after I retired. I'm divorced. My son has grown, and so I decided to go back to school, and while I was in school, I heard about Toastmasters, and the two things kind of collided. Toastmasters was teaching me how to speak and have leadership skills. And in the college courses I was taking was teaching me how to be a good writer. And I had, when I got home from a trip to Nepal in the mid nineties, I had kept a journal while I was climbing in the Himalayas and on the first trip. And it taught me that if I wanted to go back, I would journal again. Well, I hit kind of a wall after I retired. I Uh, I was sort of in a midlife crisis and a mid-career crisis and trying to figure out what I was going to do with the rest of my life. And so I decided to go ahead and look at that that manuscript and come out with a book. And in Toastmasters and ultimately the National Speakers Association, 
they always tell you, if you want to get known, you got to have a book. You got to have something you can sell at the back of the room and make a few extra bucks and, and, uh, and tell your story. So I took my journal and uh, the second trip that I had taken to Nepal was in the mid nineties. And I got lost within the first four hours of being in the Himalayas. Wow. And I had to travel a, a, a quite a ways to get to the, where the trailhead was by bus. And it was those roads that you see on YouTube where the, the bus is going along and there's this cliff that drops oh, down yeah. a thousand feet. Amazing when two buses meet and they have to jockey and make it work and they scrape. They actually scrape as they go by each other. And I, I really enjoyed the trek, but the, the first four days were pretty tough because I, I got lost that first afternoon. And so I, I kept a journal and I wrote about it. And the, it's called Tenacity. You don't have to get lost in Nepal to find yourself, but it helps. <laughs> um, that, that, that title kind of grabs people a little bit and it, it tells the story of what an, an adventure memoir, if you will of what it was like being lost in the Himalayas for a number of days and all the trials and tribulations that I went through. But out of that jur- out of that journal, that trip came the book. And the book then, once I, I wrote it and got it published, and it started to make waves within National Speakers Association, and I started getting gigs. And then the pandemic hit. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> and we none of us were working for about a year. So now we're back pushing things and making things happen again. And isn't it wonderful that the universe gave us podcasts? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> If if we hadn't, what did where, where were we before the pandemic? Podcasts were starting to happen, right. but they weren't what they are today. Yeah, and and you understand that you've been at it now a while, and and you understand the success that can come out of it. So that's my books. That, that's the I did a children's book, but it's not for sale anymore. It was sort of a a sad book. It was made for children. I was in the insurance business for a long time and I would deliver death claim checks and the kids didn't quite know what was going on. And so I wrote a grieving book for children, but Americans don't know how to grieve. And so the book didn't sell very well. We don't know what to do with death in this country. We don't know how to handle it, which is sad. So anyway, uh, then I dove into kind of the other electronic side of things and started making YouTube videos. And I came up with Trip tips, uh, which were the tenacity, resilient imagination and purpose was my acronym from that came out of my book. And those character traits started to apply themselves as I looked more and more into how I could use them. And so I came up with, I'm up to number f- uh, 56, no, 46 right now. I've got six to go. I'm going to make a package of them. 52 weeks of trip tip motivational videos and people can can buy them as a bundle here in, in the next few weeks so i love i love youtube i like they're only three minutes long each one of them they're quick they're easy they're motivational hopefully fun and and that's what i'm playing at right now oh i see now i admire you because you're on you're on youtube it's like i had a show then it's kind of fallen off because i'm trying to you know do all these other things and speaking and everything so um yeah Pandemic is great, isn't it? It makes you uh, think with it. <laughs> You're so right. Yeah, the, the last thing that came up was this past summer, uh, was in May or June, as I kind of told you in the pre-show, I, I felt like I'd hit a, a ceiling or a wall with my, with my business. Obviously, pandemic really brought it to a screeching halt, but I got to thinking, what other ways can I get this out to people? Because people need to know how how they do with tenacity and resilience. And I came up with the idea while watching a terrible old horror movie on a Saturday night. It's funny what your mind will do during an old show like that. And I thought, why don't I do an assessment where people can actually take a test and see how they score at the four character traits? And I found some experts in the field. It took us almost four months to develop it. It just came out a few weeks ago. It's called the Trip Technique Assessment. It's at triptechnique.com. And it gauges your strengths in each of those character traits and your weaknesses. And we give you a score when it's over with. And then you receive four weekly emails after that giving you ideas as to how you can continue to bring your uh, your skills up so that you'll be stronger at them. Uh, 
And then if people want to sign on for my newsletter, they'll get tips every week from that uh, as we're continuing to go forward. But it, that's been a lot of fun. Developing an assessment is a hoot. You got to develop the questions. You got to develop the answers. You got to develop the score. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and a lot of that technical stuff I couldn't do. So I had to hire some people that could do it for me. Yeah. Assessments are, because uh, I've done some of them, you know, being in the technical field, you're right. You got the answers, the questions, the score. And, and it's always, to me, I'm always going, so how do I score this? You know, what's what makes this whatever, you know, is it going to be a one, two, uh, best, 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 you know, all of that kind of stuff. <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so you're okay. So this is what I was thinking. So you've done your trips around the world. You've, um, went to Nepal twice. How did this come about? Okay. Cause you know, your book and your journal were based off of these trips. How did you end up in Nepal? First trip was with a girlfriend. Um, she, well, not a girlfriend, a good friend who was a girl. <laughs> 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 Got to clarify this. Um, she and I were sitting on New Year's Eve in 1991. No, 92. And she had just broken up with her boyfriend. I just gotten a divorce. We're both kind of crying in our beer on New Year's Eve. We're not with the people we wanted to be with. And she said, why don't we take a trip together? Well, I thought she meant like San Francisco. Mm-hmm. <laughs> she grabs <laughs> she grabs an atlas and she starts flipping through it, looking at maps. And she says, ooh, I said, what's the matter? She says, let's go here. And it was Nepal. Well, I'd only had a, a briefest amount of information about even where Nepal was. Right. You know, it re- resides right between India and China. Mm-hmm. And that's where the Himalayas are. Well, here in Colorado, we're used to the mountains. Right. And we spend a lot of time in them. And she said, let's go there. And I said, well, that sounds like quite a trip. She said, yeah, well, we've got enough time to plan it to go this fall. Because the time to go is in October or November. It's a good weather time. And so we planned it and we went together and we had a blast. We uh, trekked for 30 days got back into some really deep areas in Nepal that a lot of people don't get to see, got up to 19,000 feet and, uh, and then came back. And you know, like a lot of people, we both got sick. There's what's known as the Kathmandu crud. <laughs> mm. That's a real bad strain of flu. And we both caught that while we were there. And, and, uh, but when we got home, we got healthy again. And then things kind of were rocky in my business. I, I kind of knew then in the mid nineties that I was going to retire sometime soon from financial planning. It wasn't where my heart was. Mm -hmm. I didn't know where it was. And so I decided to go back to Nepal because of that midlife crisis and, and I decided to just, you know, see what I could find. Well, I landed in Kathmandu and I had originally purchased a trekking permit that would take me to base camp of Everest. I didn't want to climb the mountain. I just wanted to get to base camp and it resides at 19,000 feet. And I'd already been to that height before. So I knew I could do it, but I didn't hire a guide and I didn't hire a porter. I thought I could do it by myself. Typical middle-aged man with a large ego. And so I, I, I get over there and they had received six feet of snow in less than a week at Everest. And there were avalanches all over the place and they wouldn't let me go into that area. They said, you just can't go. We're going to have to make you uh, pick a different, different place for your trekking permit. So I picked a mountain called Kenkanjunga in the Northeastern corner of Nepal. And it's the second highest, but it's very, it's not very well known. Well, getting back into that area of Nepal was hard. And like I said earlier, I got to where I was going and I, I, um, I started my trek and I was lost and within a short period of time. And so that was when I wrote the journal that actually started to plan when I was going to retire and what I was going to do after I retired. And I actually wrote down then that I thought that public speaking might be a lot of fun. Well, you know, be careful what you wish for. Uh Uh, Sometimes they come true. I don't know how things have happened for you in your life, but if I write something down and I kind of commit myself to it, I can go back and look and it's already occurred. And I go back and wow, I I thought I would about doing this five years ago. Right. And that's what journaling is. The one of the beauties of journaling is getting to look back at your past and see where you've come from. Oh yeah. I'm similar. I have, it's funny because I found 
Um, at the time I wasn't really into journaling. I do it now, but I found like a notebook that I have wrote some things in and I was flipping through it and it was like, Oh, become an author, become a speaker. And I'm like, Oh, I've done that. I was like, I didn't know that this was something I wanted to do back then. So it's very, uh, yeah, it's very, um, just interesting how life happens that way when, you, you know, you speak it, you write it and then comes to pass you the know. angels are watching aren't they yeah yeah no i i there's that old saying i told you i was in vietnam there, there's that old saying that foxholes don't don't have any uh atheists in them no. um, and <laughs> and and that is so true and i think that i had a spiritual upbringing my parents mm-hmm. were were spiritual my mom um, belonged to a methodist church my dad wasn't quite so much until his later years but I went to church every Sunday with my mom for a very long time. And then as I've gotten older, the spirituality has kind of entered into it just a little bit more. And the religious, um, it's the word I'm looking for, uh, attributes are falling to the wayside a little bit. Mm -hmm. But there's still that Methodist foundation of God Mm -hmm. that is important in my life. And I feel like I have the angels looking over me so much. I I have lived a wonderful life of, of... climbing mountains and racing cars and racing bicycles and, and all of those things had inherent danger in them, but I've always felt a little protected. Even when I crashed and broke my left collarbone. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So, you know, you still feel like these are things we're meant to experience and that we're protected and and that, and that things are, are taking us where we need to go and how we need to get there. We don't even know it when it starts and then you're halfway through it and you're going, wow, this is cool. You know, and I feel the same way because I, I am um, spiritual. I, I do believe God and God and he's my higher being and all of that. But how, did, how did you come to a point? Cause you retired from a career as a CFP and you said, okay, now I'm going to ride motorcycles. I'm going to travel the world, climb mountains. Um, how does one get to that point where they're so um, just want to live life to the fullest? Because I think you said one of your your things is, you know, time is too precious to waste. You know, <laughs> and I, I believe that, too, because so many things have happened in our life. Just think of where we are today in this world. Right. We're in the middle of a pandemic. People have lost loved ones due to the pandemic. And things have changed, not only losing people, people have lost jobs, people have decided to start businesses. All these different things have come from the situation that we're in. So how, what took place in your life where you say, you know what, time is just precious and I'm going to do all of these things because a lot of people, they retire and they're like, nope, I'm just going to sit here and, you know, sit in my, my rocking chair and watch TV. You know, what well, made couple, you not do that? There's a couple things that came out of all of my life that's kind of uh, brought itself to that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Vietnam was a big part of it. I mentioned that I was on guard duty a few times. And uh, even though I was around Saigon, there was a fair amount of activity that took place in the, at the nighttime. And that's when we would always walk guard. And there were enough times there that that made me stop and think. You know, if I get out of this, I'm I'm going to go home and make something of myself, and so that foundation got laid early on over there. I I, I don't know that I matured late in life. I, I got home from Vietnam in tw- at age 23. I joined an insurance company at 27. Got my CFP uh, 10 years later, and so it kind of just kept moving along. But it seems like there was that foundation of of tenacity and resilience that came out of Vietnam, especially the resilience, Uh, like the pandemic, you have to have that bottom. You have to reach bottom before you can really bounce back up sometimes. And I think we're all built with different bottoms. Mm. And I can, my bottom isn't as shallow as it used to be. Okay. I reach it quick and I bounce back up. Whereas a lot of people keep dropping and dropping and dropping. And that's why we've had a lot of, of depression over the pandemic with being locked up in home and no, no contact with friends and family other than like this. And I think that people have either learned through this, that depression is easily achieved if you allow it. 
and you have to work at being resilient. And what I tell a lot of people in my uh, keynote speeches and in my workshops is you've, it's all about friendships. It's all about relationships. We have to bolster each other back up. I'm in a mastermind group with four other professional speakers. And that group has been just worth uh, so much during the pandemic because when one of us was down, the other was other ones would build us back up. And we've maintained a pretty high level of productivity and creativity during it. And one of our members is blind. And so <laughs> we've we've uh, he's had a particularly difficult time of it. And now he's the busiest of all of us. He's got more <laughs> speaking gigs going than any of us do. I think we propped him up too much. But <laughs> and then I, I guess I'd have to say that the insurance business is it's so closely related to death, either health insurance or life insurance. They both you get to watch your clients go through a lot of trauma. Yeah. And it gives you a certain sense of strength that you are helping them through this time, either through taking, helping them take care of their health insurance claims, or if it's a death in the family that you're, you're the only guy that shows up. That's not asking for money. Mm. You're the only one that shows up with a check. Right. And that makes such a difference. And I would, I would say that during those years, I, I gained a lot of empathy and compassion for people seeing what they were going through that builds strength of character within you yeah. if you will allow it. And I, I think that helped me a lot to be able to get to where I could just keep pushing, keep doing. I mean, I'll be 74 in, in two months and I have absolutely no, no uh, idea of retiring at all. I'm still skiing. Uh, I just signed up to ski again at a, at a resort again this winter. Uh, I, you know, I'm still racing my, well, not racing, I'm riding my bike with my racing club, but uh, I wish I could still race cars, but that's just gotten too expensive. So, mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> but I have yeah. had a good life and I'm very grateful. And I suppose that's the last thing I would say is that I, because of my mom and her spiritual upbringing of mine, I have a deep sense of gratitude. Mm -hmm. And I think that the military taught you that as well. Uh, you had to hang on to your friends. Your buddies were the, supporting you and taking care of you and were there when you needed them. And you had to be grateful for, for all of that. I mean, I go out for a bike ride two, three times a week here in Denver, and I've got a real special route that I do that's 22 miles. I can do it in about an hour and a half. And I, I look at the scenery and I feel the air and I feel the warm sun on my skin. And I am, uh, sometimes it brings me to tears because I am so grateful to, to, leave, to live the life I'm living. And it's, uh, it makes you really appreciative of what you've got and, and makes you want to continue to do more. Yeah. You know, and that's funny because not many people look at life like that. You know, it's always some, <clears throat> you know, there's always some of the people who are, you know, the glass is half empty type of people <laughs> like, oh, my God, why is me? This is what we're going through. Oh, you know, I hate this. I hate that. And you're like, yeah, can't you just like be glad you're alive? Yeah. <laughs> can't you be glad you're alive? Can't you be glad that you're actually um, breathing and, and having a, a new day? But people don't look at things like that. Yeah, my first words that go across my mind, I have trained myself to do this is every morning when I wake up, it's praise God and thank you for another day. Yep. I, I do the same thing. And that's interesting. So is that how you came up with um, the acronym TRIP, just based on that? It was a combination of the words that showed up a lot in the journal and oh. a good friend of mine in the National Speakers Association who helped me kind of formulate what I could do with it. Okay. And because I, I had three of the letters and I couldn't get the fourth one and they weren't in the proper order at that time. Mm -hmm. And she helped me come up with the last of them. So uh, it, it, it all kind of just fit when it, when I heard it, it was like, oh my God, that's perfect. Now I've got it. All four character traits fit into a portion of your life when you're struggling, you know, with tenacity, you have to push through something with resilience when you got to get back from being down to being creative, using your imagination to think, how can I do this better than what I've done before that hasn't worked or it hasn't worked as well as I want it to. And then the glue that holds everything together is purpose. Because mm. without having a good solid purpose, you're like a ship in the night, man. You're just right. going all over the ocean. You don't have any place, no goal to get to, no port that you can really say that you're headed to. You don't have any purpose that you're living for. And I, uh, I wrote in my blog here last week that 
we can have multiple purposes. Mm -hmm. People just always think, what's my purpose in life? Well, they're looking for something grandiose. Right. Heck, it could be just as good as kicking, cooking your kid breakfast in the morning. Right. They want that smiling dad face in the morning that makes pancakes with funny eyes and a mm-hmm. smile on it. You know, it, purpose can be all kinds of things, but it needs to be something that's consistent, needs to be something you commit to, mm-hmm. and it needs to be something that is just a little hard to attain. Mm. Because if it's a little hard, you'll push a little harder to get there. And then you feel good about it once you've achieved it. Mm, I love that. I love that. It's a little hard to attain. And that's something that's so hard that it's going to demotivate you. No. It's something that's going to keep you striving because you, you're you like, yep, I can get it. I'm reaching. I'm working. I'm getting to there. The grandiose purposes are like New Year's Eve resolutions that make it to the 2nd of January. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> you know, it's the, yes, yeah, the, oh, I'm going to lose weight. So you see everybody, you know, in the gym repenting for their sins on the first and then on the second is like empty. <laughs> I know. I know. It's crazy. <laughs> it's, that is so funny. I mean, and I, I love, I love the, the trip acronym and what it stands for, because you're right. Those are seasons that we go through in our lives and things yeah. that we, we go through and that we have to, um, cause you're, you know, you're not always being, you know, imaginative or creative, but you go through all these different stages and you definitely need to know your purpose in life. And I love what you said about, you can have several purposes. People often think, and I used to think this too, a long time ago is like, okay, what is my purpose? And you were like, okay, there's one just thing that I was just meant to do. And it's like, no, you could be meant to do several things. It's not oh, yeah. just one thing because we're all we're all living, breathing humans. And, you know, what we may do and be in one season of our lives, another season, it may turn out to be something different. So, so um, true. Yeah. So, so true. you don't have to have one purpose. And I don't, I think a lot of people um, don't understand that. This past weekend, <clears throat> excuse me, on Saturday, uh, well, let me back up a second. M- my father passed away three years ago. He was 97. He was wow. he really made it a long ways. Um, and I, I kept his house. It's a, uh, out in the country. I didn't want to sell it right away. And mm-hmm. I, I w- moved into that house in 1954 when I had the measles of all things. And dad <laughs> had to cover my face but so the sunshine wouldn't affect me because mm-hmm. you can actually go blind with measles if you get sunlight in your eyes. Oh. And uh, uh, so he carried me in the house in 1954. So I've owned this, been in this house for a very long time. And this last Saturday, <clears throat> I had to take down a pine tree in the backyard. And the house is 100 years old this year. Wow. <clears throat> and so that tree was close to that age, wow. just like my dad. And it really made me emotional to sit in his kitchen that day. And I wrote yeah. a blog about it, about the purposes of what that tree served over the years. You know, it gave us something that was beautiful to look at as it was growing. It grew straight and tall and it was gigantic when it died. And it gave us shelter during the the storms that would come through and the shelter from the sun in the summertime, we'd sit underneath it and have picnics and barbecues and stuff. And that tree was just a source of beauty to me. And Losing dad three years ago and then losing the tree this year, it kind of had a bittersweet Mm -hmm. kind of feel to it because my father and I were exceedingly close. And it was just the realization that that's why I've kept this house is that I can go there and I can be creative. I can write. I can think. I can go for walks out on the prairie. And it's still serving a purpose. And that tree now is a stump that I'm going to put a table on and I'm going to put a gazebo over it. And so it'll serve a whole new brand new purpose with a new batch of people that'll come over for gatherings rather than the ones that mom and dad had. So time just keeps moving along and it doesn't wait for anybody. And so you better pick those purposes and and delve into them and recognize them for what they are and how blessed you are to have them and have many of them. I've got a travel purpose and a sports purpose. I'm actually learning the piano right now after all these years. So you you never get too old to have different purposes. Excuse me. Got a frog in my throat. Wow. I love that. I really, really love that. You're never too old to have purpose, you know, and 
yeah, it's just amazing. And I guess if you, I guess it's, it's depends on how you think about life. You know, if you think that life is something that should be enjoyed and lived, then you know, okay, yeah, I, I, I can have purpose and it can be several and it can change from year to year or whatever that may be. Yeah, I think I got a little of that from my parents. I don't know what your parents were like, but my parents were homebodies. Mm -hmm. And they were Depression era kids. Mm. You know, dad was born in 21 and mom was born in 1918. And uh, so they learned to pinch pennies. They learned to save things. As I have gone through his drawers and his cabinets and things, he's got little containers that are full of paper clips and little containers are full of tacks and little containers full of all kinds of things that he collected because he never knew when he might need them. And if he didn't have a lot of money, you had them already saved up. And so I kind of learned that because they were homebodies and because they saved so much during their life to give them a, a good retirement, that I didn't want to be a homebody. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to pinch pennies. And to some extent, that's why I became a financial planner, because I was terrible with money mm-hmm. <laughs> for a very long time. I couldn't <laughs> save a dime. <laughs> and So when I found that I could actually help other people with their finances and I could earn a good living doing it, my traveling started to happen Mm. because that was, that was when I started to realize mom and dad are never going to go anywhere. I kept asking him, come on, let's go take a cruise. Let's go to Alaska. Let's go to Florida. You know, they saw a lot of Colorado because they'd take their vacations there, but they never left the state much. My mom was only on an airplane once in her lifetime. (laughs) She flew to Seattle, Washington, and they rented a car and they drove home. That was the only really long vacation they ever took. And that's while I was in Vietnam. And other than that, they didn't go anywhere. So I I was of the mindset early on that I did not want to be a homebody. I wanted to get out and see the world. Um, Just a year and a half ago, I went to uh, Antarctica. And I went by way of Santiago, Chile, then into Buenos Aires, um, Argentina. And then we caught the, the boat from there and went to the Falkland Islands and then into mm-hmm. Antarctica and came around the, the Horn of South America back up under the Chilean side. Mm-hmm. And we were gone for four weeks. And that was a, a spectacular trip because I got to see five countries mm-hmm. plus a lot of ice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Antarctica is an amazing place to go to. And wow. I had never taken a cruise before. It was my first cruise. So I would encourage you to do that. That was part of my my list of dreams, my list of my stuff I wanted on my purpose list for travel to to satisfy. Nice. So. That's nice. Well, I'm interested because we're getting ready to get our questions. So I'm interested how you're going to answer these. Okay, go for it. Okay. Who or what motivates you? I hope this doesn't sound egotistical, but I motivate me. Mm-hmm. I'm I light up. I can wake up in the mornings, and I'm like everybody else. I got a little anxiety. I got I got a podcast. Oh God, am I prepared for this podcast? <laughs> um, and I have to fire myself up. I have to get myself going because I live alone, and there's nobody here that I can really count on. I, I could make a phone call to a friend or two, but I've never been a person that that puts my problems on other people, unless it's really dire. And so I work, I I get my phone out. I go through the social media. Mm -hmm. I find some stuff to laugh at and I start getting my energy going like that. And then I plan my day. When can I get on my bicycle? When can I get some exercise and go to the gym, whatever. And so I, I have been so self-reliant. My last divorce was a long time ago. And so I've had to be very self-reliant in my own entertainment. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) I have to make myself laugh occasionally, which I do a lot of stupid things. So that doesn't, that that happens pretty easily. But uh, yeah, I, I, other than that, it would be my son who is Mm -hmm. growing up. He's 27. He's growing up to be just a, quite a wonderful young man. And we talk at the end of every day and uh, that keeps me motivated too. Okay. What demotivates you? What? I try not to think about (laughs) demo. What demotivates me? I'm a deadline guy. 
Okay. I love deadlines. I work hardest when I've got a deadline, okay. but I'm, I'm also a procrastinator. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think that what Dean motivates me is that I can see something that has to be done and I don't want to do it yet. And that mm-hmm. gets me down because I should, I should find the energy to dive in and to make it happen. It's I'm uh, my son's getting married in two weeks on the 13th of November, and I'm going to officiate. I'm going to be the minister. Oh. I signed up and got my ministerial uh, certificate of ministry. Wow! <laughs> <laughs> Never thought I'd ever see the day I'd be a minister. Holy cow. Um, and so I'm, I'm practicing their wedding vows and what I'm going to be saying for his stuff. And so that's kind of uh, been dragging me down a little because I'm not really as prepared as I want to be. So I've got to get motivated to get that up and going because I'm time's running out. (laughs) Yes, it is. Get on that. When was a time that something was said or done to hurt you, but it worked out for your good? When I was in the insurance business, I had a partner in my office who was a colonel in the army in Vietnam. He was quite a bit older than me and he had already gotten home from over there um, many years by the time I got home. And we met when we were in the, in the training for the insurance company. And we, we liked each other and we decided to office together. Mm-hmm. And he was sort of my bank. Mm-hmm. He uh, had a good income from being an army colonel, retired, mm-hmm. and he had owned some real, real rental property and whatnot. And when you start an insurance business, you've got to fund everything your own, yourself because mm-hmm. the company doesn't give you money to do that. And, you can't make a lot of money with sales. You sell your family and then who are you going to sell to after that? (laughs) (laughs) And so when I needed money, I got it from John and John always told me, he says, be careful how much you spend because you got to pay it back. And those were the years in the late seventies, early eighties when interest rates were double digit. Yeah. And he was charging me 18%. (laughs) Well, it was an incentive. He wanted me to pay it back. He didn't want me to just leave it sit there. And so it, that turned out really well. Uh, it was it was a hard lesson to learn because I was buying office furniture and I was buying copying machines and I shouldn't have spent all that money. I shouldn't. I should have started small and stayed small until I grew. But I, I um, felt bigger than my britches, mm-hmm. and you know, and it. Uh, I had to learn that lesson the hard way. But it turned out okay because he he hung in there with me for a long time and got my business off the ground. And we're still friends to this day. He's a wonderful man. Wow. What is your fear? I always have a fear of, I'm a people pleaser. Mm. And I have a fear of letting people down. Mm. Of not, like I've got a speaking gig coming up on the the 4th of November. And I'm developing a whole new PowerPoint for it, a whole new presentation Mm -hmm. for it to go along with the assessment that we were talking about earlier. And I've been rehearsing and putting in new slides and rehearsing and taking slides out. And Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know what it's like, you know where I'm at. (laughs) And and I don't want to, I don't want to, because there'll be a number of my friends there. I don't want to let them down. I want to just give a really good performance. Yeah. And I I always have a fear of letting people down. And uh, that's, that's, that can be a a big one. Yeah. Uh, You know, especially if you do let them down and then you feel terrible afterwards, but I'm not going to let that happen. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Is there a time when you wish you had done something that you didn't? More than I can count. <laughs> <laughs> Always. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, that's, that's part of being human, I think. Um, yeah, I've been divorced twice. And I guess I would have to say that I shouldn't have done it the first time. Mm-hmm. Uh, we should have just stayed friends. Mm-hmm. And sometimes love uh, gets compu- confused with lust and mm-hmm. we get, uh, we make decisions that we shouldn't, and then we regret them later. Yeah. So I'd have to say that she, I, I, it was really strange. I hadn't seen her in 30 years and I ran into her in a store uh, last summer and she had never been in that store before and would never come back because she completely lived across town, but she saw that store and needed to buy something that it had. And she went in and got it. And I walked in. <laughs> and I go to that store every day because that's, that's where my post office box is for my business. And it was like, holy cow, why did we run into each other? What, what caused this? And I almost felt like telling her that day, 
you know, we should never have gotten married. But I just, <laughs> <laughs> that didn't exactly seem like the right thing to say. So I kept my mouth shut. <laughs> yeah, probably not. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Is there a time that you wish you had not done something? <clears throat> there are 54 14,000 foot peaks in Colorado. Mm hmm. I've climbed 26 of them. And there have been a couple of those mountains when I've gotten myself into trouble. Oh. And going uh, when you're going up a mountain it's uh, it's a whole lot easier than coming down actually. Uh, mm -hmm. And going up you can see where you want to go off and sometimes the trail is very obscured and sometimes you lead yourself into an area where all of a sudden you can't do anything, but go back the way you came because you've come up upon a cliff. You can't go down. You can't go around. You can't go up. And sometimes the conditions were not good. So uh, one mountain in particular was called Long's Peak here in Colorado. It's 14,200, I think. And uh, I was with my friend Shelly, who I went to Nepal with, and we had you had to leave about two o'clock in the morning to climb that mountain because it's a very long, long climb. It's like a corkscrew. You just keep going up. Mm. And we got wrapped around and got to this one place where there's what's known as the narrows. And it's a four foot wide uh, ledge that goes about 20 feet. And it had snowed when we got up there and we didn't have any equipment for snow. And that ledge was slippery. And there were people that were doing it, but they had crampons, which are those metal things that go on yeah. the bottom of your shoes when you mm -hmm. when you climb. And I, we didn't have any. So at that point, we were only about 150 feet from the summit. And we turned what? around and went back. And so uh, there have been a number of those kinds of climbs that I've regretted going as far as I did and had to work to get myself out of it. <laughs> wow. Oh. What is your definition of success? I don't know that I'll ever really satisfy that one. Uh, I know a lot of people have a dollar sign on it or a certain job. With me, I guess just being a good human being, mm -hmm. you know, uh, what's going on in our country right now is so mm -hmm. sad. Uh, I, I really dislike all the hatred and the pointing of fingers. And I mean, it's just, it's hard. We, we didn't, we haven't been this way before in this country and the division's terrible mm -hmm. and success for the country. I think right now would be people reuniting and starting to love one another again. And I think that that's how I look at life. That's, that's my vision of success for me is that I can't meet a person that I can't like. Right. You know, yeah. I mean, you and I never have met each other before today and we're having a blast. Right. Why couldn't most people do that? Exactly. You know, it's not that hard. Just be human. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. How do you recharge besides the climbing of the mountains? <laughs> <laughs> bicycle. The bicycle was my salvation during this pandemic. Uh, I racked up 3,500 miles last year. Um, <laughs> just within my county. I didn't hardly go anywhere because they weren't letting us. But yeah, my bicycle is my salvation. I, I went through two sets of tires last year and I, I'm still riding a lot this year as well. There's not to be, a, it's like, it's so childlike mm. being on a bicycle. Okay. You know, little kids hop on a bike and they pedal and they go and they giggle and they're having so much fun. Well, so do I. It's 73 yeah. years old. I, there, there's endorphins that get generated when you exercise and, and it puts a smile on your face and you're saying hello to people that are passing you by. And, uh, you know, uh, you speak to people when you stop for a rest and you get to know them and it, you're just happy. Mm. Uh, I recharge on my bicycle and wow. I do it two or three times a week. And it's, I would in, uh, tell anybody that wants to try and find a way to get some good exercise and, and become happy, go buy a bike. Mm. What are you awesome at? Actually, I'm getting pretty darn good at video editing. <laughs> wow, really? I really like it. Uh, I found a, a really good software called Muvavi that works for PCs. And it's, it's 
technical enough, but it's uh, it's simple enough that I can really enjoy making my YouTube videos. I've got a virtual assistant who lives in Austin, Texas, okay. and she keeps telling me, Keith, you want me to edit your videos? I really like editing. I said, no, Wendy, I like editing my videos. <laughs> you can't have that job. <laughs> Well, I'm going to have to send my videos to you. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh, what legacy do you want to leave? Oh, that's a good one. I I wouldn't have thought of these two words probably 20 years ago, but intellectual property. Mm, okay. I think my legacy will speak for itself through the books, the videos, the blogs, Um you know, I don't know if how Michael, will, my son, will maintain any of that, but I think that I'm not done writing. I know I've got a, a couple more books still in me. I've got a lot of stories to tell, mm-hmm. and I think that hopefully those books will live on. You know, as long as there's a way to find them. Have you ever wondered? I'm going to go off on a limb here with you. Have you ever wondered if there has been a civilization on Earth long before we got here? Because the the planet's been here a billion years, right? Mm -hmm. And we only can go back about 30,000, 40,000 years that we can go back to Cro-Magnon Man and stuff. But what happened if there was a society that was on the planet half a million years ago and they they were so technical like we are, and then they wiped themselves out and there was nothing to find because it was all in computers. Hmm. There was no paper. There was no way to find it. It all disappeared. Mm. And then the earth had its gigantic asteroid that hit it and burned the planet. And then we had the ice age and we'd come back and here we are today. That was a quick, quick history, wasn't it? Yeah. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So my point being that Haley, Michael's fiance uh, sent me some stuff today. And I said, you got to be taking pictures of these kinds of things. You're going to want to look back on them with your children. And she says, Oh, I hadn't thought of that. And I said, yeah, my mom kept uh, photo albums. And every once in a while, she dragged the albums out mm-hmm. so we could look back at our relatives from years and years ago and remember who they were. You know, like the Indians would sit around the campfire and tell stories of what had happened in the in the years before them. Mm-hmm. If we don't maintain things, if I just keep it in a computer, who's going to see it? And so that's yeah. why books, I hope, will maintain. I hope they'll stay in paper. I hope we don't get yeah. completely onto the ebooks. I think paperback books are just so important to hold and to read and to touch and smell. I love the smell of a new book, the, mm-hmm. new, the ink and the paper. Um, you know, when you crack it open, the spine kind of pops and you've got to, yeah. you know, there's those tactile things that are in life that we can't experience any other way without doing it. I can't experience that on a computer. Mm, I never thought about that, but you're right. You're very, very right. Mm. <laughs> so that was one, but give give the listeners one motivational takeaway. I think that was pretty motivational, but give the listeners a motivational takeaway. Um, can I do it with a story? Yes. So in 1974, I went to work for a man that had just moved to Colorado and he, he left uh, California uh, with his wife, and all of his furniture was still in storage in Sausalito, California, across the bay from San Francisco. And my roommate at the time and I were both working for this guy, and we said, well, we'll just drive to San Francisco, and we'll rent a truck and bring it back. And he said, okay, great. Well, I had an MG Midget. Uh, I know you're too young to remember what yeah. those were, but it's a small <laughs> little British sports car, okay. yeah, two, two-seater, and it's a ragtop. It's a convertible. And this is in January. We're going to go to California. Yeah. So we hop in the car. We we go across Wyoming and we hit a snowstorm. And that car didn't have a great heater and the roof leaked air. And so we're going across Wyoming. We get into Utah. We drop down. It's a little warmer, but it's still cold. We're wearing our, our down jackets in the car. Um, <laughs> and so well. Uh, we pull out, we're really tired. It's at night and we pull off the side of the road. And I, it was just one of those little areas I could see what looked like a, um, maybe a cattle guard for, uh, for a ranch or a farm. Mm-hmm. And so I just pulled off and I stopped the winds howling. It's snowing. We decided it was a good time not to be driving. So we both curled up in the car, leaning against our windows and we went to sleep and probably three or four hours later, there was this huge roar. And we're, what the heck is that? And I turned the headlights on on the car. And the front bumper of my car was about six inches from a railroad track. <gasps> oh, 
<laughs> and the cars are just flying by and the, the snow is whirling and stuff. And so we, our hearts are pounding, you know, we're scared. So we, we get out, we drive, we get on into Sausalito and we find the place where the storage is at. We find the truck. It won't be ready for a day or so. So we decide to, we're going to go out to dinner that night and see what it's like the next day and see if we'll be able to leave. And we go into this restaurant in Sausalito. Uh, had a, a a view of the bay and of the uh, the, the uh, Golden Gate Bridge, and we ordered lobster and Heineken was brand new beer in America mm-hmm. back then, and so we both had a Heineken and beer, and we're having our lobster, and the restaurant starts to fill up, and and our, we there's only a couple waiters working, we keep hollering at him, hey bring bring the tab, we want to pay, we want to let these people have our chair, and we must have waited forty minutes for the check, well finally. It's gotten so noisy and people are really gathered around us. And Aaron, my friend, says, we ought to just leave. He's never coming. And I thought he said, let's go. He's never coming. And so I got up and walked out. And so did he. And so we get in the car and we rush away. And we're laughing that we've done this stupid thing. <laughs> so we get the truck the next day. We're driving back to through uh, to uh, Reno, Nevada, going over Donner Pass. And we hit another really bad snowstorm and the windshield wipers break. Oh. And so we're out there. He's got a scraper while we're going 45 miles an hour, scraping the windshield. And we get into Reno, we buy a, a, a new blade for the windshield wiper. We get to green river, Wyoming, and the headlights are really getting dim. And we're, what is wrong? And we fi- pull into a gas station. Well, we've had a fan belt break and it's not, the alternator's not working. So we buy a fan belt. And we're looking at each other, man, this is really awful. What's all, what can happen next? Well, we pull into Fort Collins, Colorado, about an hour from home, and a police officer pulls me over because the car I'm towing, my MG Midget, doesn't have any lights on it in the dark. He gives us a ticket. So we're sitting there looking at each other after the ticket, and he said, you don't think this is karma from that <laughs> restaurant, do you? That's what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> so the moral of the story is always pay your bills. <laughs> Otherwise, you get that kind of a story that will hopefully motivate you to do the good things in life and not stiff somebody for a meal. Yeah. Uh, it's not a story I'm proud of, but it's a good story to tell because it's funny. Yeah. Yeah. It was karma. <laughs> <laughs> I totally. Totally. I can tell you that. <laughs> oh, my God. Keith, tell the listeners how they can connect with you, um, your book, speaking engagement, the assessment, all of that. Amazon has my book and you can just put my name in it. And uh, Trina will have that in the in the notes for the podcast. Uh, KeithRenanson.com. Renanson ha- is kind of spelled different. It's got four ends in it. I always tell everybody it sounds like a two cycle motor engine. It's <laughs> Renanson. It's R E N N I N S O N. First name Keith. KeithRenanson.com. Or if it's easier to remember, go to the trip technique.com. And that'll take you to my website, which has the assessment on it. It has my books on it. And uh, it'll tell you about my speaking gigs and uh, they can find me through the website pretty easily. But the triptechnique.com is probably the easiest. All right. Well, Keith, thank you for being on. Thank you for that great story. At the end. <laughs> <laughs> You're oh, welcome. And just for uh, being on and sharing a good conversation with, uh, with me about your assessment and being resilient and all the great things that you're doing. So uh, thank you very much. Well, you're welcome. And and the sad part of being a host is that you never get to learn anything about the person that's putting on the podcast. So someday I would like to learn more about you. If I get my own podcast, I'm going to call you to come be a guest on mine. Please do. Or you can (laughs) let me come speak somewhere. (laughs) Let's stay in touch. I'd appreciate that. And it's been a blast being with you. You've got a great sense of humor, a wonderful smile. You've been very uh, easy to talk to. And I I really appreciate that. Thank you. Well, thank you. I want to thank my guests for being on the show, and I want to thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show, and don't forget to tune in next week.